coming. Um, we're very, very excited because we have been um, eagerly awaiting um, the spirituality series. Um, and this is something that we've had other presentations in the past, um, but finally this is officially launching. And we're going to have a lot of different uh, presentations by various uh, different leaders in the community, uh, religious leaders. And um, we're very happy now to have uh, Monsignor Navarro back. Today is a very special presentation on healing the wounds of anger and violence from a Christian perspective. Um, and before we continue, let me just go ahead and tell you a little bit about our presenter. I know Monsignor, you don't like this part. <laughs> Monsignor Navarro um, earned his PhD in theology from Harvard Divinity School. He earned two master's degree in divinity and history and two bachelor's degree in philosophy and history. He has been a Catholic priest for 38 years and has been on the Community Relations Board, which is a civic and religious group to promote peace and harmony in the community for the last 30 years. He is also a member of the National Council of Christians and Jews, which is an organization that promotes understanding and cooperation between people of the Christian and Jewish faith. In addition, Monsignor Navarro has also served in the South Florida Community Relations Board for the promotion of peace and harmony in a multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multilingual community. So if you could please um, put your hands together and welcome Monsignor. Sometimes it's burnout and fatigue that is not addressed, or burnout and fatigue that is allowed to fester in the individual. I do not pretend that the presentation tonight is going to solve uh, bringing a solution to anything. The solutions have to happen in the heart and, from, and emanate from the heart. But at least something for you to ponder, not only individually, as we all need to do individually, but for us to ponder as people who touch other people. And particularly you who are going to be in, in mental health, or who are already in mental health, 
I, it's amazing the persons that you touch, you will never know how many other people they, they will touch in turn. So something that you may begin, you may know that it begins here, but you don't know the ramifications. And that's why we need to be so careful and, you know, and so thorough in this. First of all, I'd like to just quote from the Gospel of Mark first. The Gospel of Mark chapter 6, verse 30 to 31 says this. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him that they had done and all that they had taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. I think some of us may resonate with that. Sometimes I notice some of you on the way uh, here this morning. I saw some of you this afternoon. I saw some of you carrying your your supper that you were probably just uh, wolfing down real quick between classes. You know, so often life is so hectic, and it's really interesting. You know, culture only happens in peacetime. During wartime, no culture flourishes because everybody's in survival mode. So they're all alert to what needs to be done immediately. But for culture to happen, there needs to be leisure for people to ponder, to think, to meditate, to be creative. And that's why this whole thing of leisure is so important. And Jesus addressed this in the Gospel. Let me give you some of the signs of fatigue. And please, no public confessions. But just uh, think about it and how often we fall into this. The signs of fatigue that can lead to burnout and a paralyzing depression could be general unhappiness or preoccupation with those for whom one is responsible. Therefore, you know, the people that we are responsible, so often we don't realize, but we're not only responsible, but we like to control them and manipulate. And sometimes, of course, we can't, and the frustration that comes from that. Another one is the lack of satisfaction with one's job or vocation choice. I should be doing more, I should be doing less, but I feel trapped. Another sign of fatigue that can lead to burnout is aging. You know, the folks that, there are people that age gracefully, and there are people that do not age gracefully. And by aging gracefully, I don't mean less or more wrinkles. I mean aging gracefully is to be able to accept yourself at any point in your life. I cannot do the things that I could do 10 years ago. I definitely cannot do the things that I could do 30 years ago. So you know what? I can either mourn all day long about what I can no longer do, or I can just accept where I am right now. You know, so, so those are the things. Aging can be a sign of fatigue that can lead to burnout and paralysis. Sickness. Sickness can, it's not only the sickness and the pain or the ache or the uh, fact that you are marginalized but sickness also brings a lot of loneliness because when you are sick, many people don't want to get close to you because they think that whatever you have may be catchy. So therefore you become more and more isolated. Death and the death of a loved one can be a, ve a very difficult thing for some that can never, some people never get over it. Ruptured in a relationship. I was talking to a lady a couple of days ago and she was pouring out her heart about how her husband left her. Well, the way she spoke, I thought her husband had just left her. Her husband left, left her 38 years ago. But she's still living it every day. She's suffering it every day. Every day, he still, I don't even think he's in the country. But he still has that hold over her. Because she has allowed him to have that hold over her. Another uh, sign of fatigue that can lead to burnout is the lack of feeling energized. You know, when you feel that somebody unplugged you, you're drained, you have no energy, you have no, no yen, you have no goal, you could care less. You know, it's almost like a, 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 not a clinical depression per se, but maybe more a, a low-grade depression. Which, by the way, there's usually low-grade depression, there's a lot of underlying anger, but I'll explain that a little bit later. Difficulty in separating one's thoughts and feelings and spiritual life from problems. So therefore, my life is a problem. Instead of, I have problems in my life. Or, you know, the school is awful. No, the school, there are some things in school that I would change. Uh, there are things in my job that I could change. Or my job is horrendous. How do I catalog? 
And once I catalog something, I can draw myself, you know, I can fetch myself into the point that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Feeling trapped in a job or a life choice. Once I make a life choice and I feel that I'm trapped in it. Increasing irritability about everyday matters. Whenever, you know, anybody tries to get close and I jump, when people are afraid to get close to me because they don't know how I'm going to react, those are all telltale signs of I need to see what it is, am I reaching a breaking point? Is a fatigue really leading to burnout and to a paralyzing depression? A general feeling of discontent, feeling of being overwhelmed, exhausted, fatigued, and a sense of one's efforts are not worthwhile or appreciated. You know, this whole, this whole malaise, these are many, many others, but I mean, I just want to bring out some of the things to see if they resonate. I'm sure you can probably mention various others. Now, some thoughts that you can uh, look into that may help in situations like this. AIDS to prevent or combat fatigue that can lead to burnout. First of all, make time daily. And it doesn't matter what faith tradition you're, you're in, but how do you make time daily for meditation, for prayer, however you perceive that to be? And it has to be, even if it's just a few minutes, it needs to be in a quiet place. Life is filled with noise. There's, when we get into the car, the first thing we do is to turn the radio on, or something on. We cannot conceive time without noise. We get up to the radio, we get up to, uh, you know, our, there's always has to be some background. How do we develop, how do we cultivate in our lives moments of quiet? Or just nothing. Being able to hear our own breathing. To be able to listen to the Lord however we perceive God. We need to have that moment of quiet to allow the Spirit of God to dwell within us. The second thing, how do we prevent or combat fatigue, is limit mental rehashing time. How do we have mental, in other words, better time management? Some people are frustrated about something, so they keep rehashing it. And they keep rehashing it. And eventually, it becomes a crushing weight. You know, you have a deadline. Well, either do something about the deadline or resolve some, some ways that you're going to manage a deadline. But just by repeating, I have a deadline, I have a deadline, I have a deadline. Eventually, it's like, you know, you can be beleaguered. How do you detail work schedules so that you can become, if life can become more manageable? Your deadlines can become more manageable. I'll give you, um, I have what, what is called the tickle file. Now, most of you who are, not most of you, all of you who are much younger than I would not have an idea what a tickle file is. But a tickle file is like a, it's something like this. It's an accordion. And you have tabs for each day of the, of the month. And what I do is I receive a letter asking me to give a talk, for example, uh, as today. Uh, Dr. Alonso asked me about two months ago, so what I did is I tickled it, I put it on for June uh, 29th. Because I figured if I leave it on my desk, every time I look at it, I'm going to obsess about it. And I'm going to be wondering, what am I going to do? So you know what? Out of sight, out of mind. Now, that's how I deal with it. How would you deal with something? In other words, if you know that your desk can look like the aftermath of a hurricane. Uh, and it doesn't matter what you have there because it's not going to bother you. That's fine. But my desk, I know where everything is. And I know that if I look at something, it's going to be, I want to be able to look at something that I need to do at the moment, or two days from now, or one day from now. But not more than that. In other words, how do you organize yourself? If you have to, as the old saying says, if you have to eat an elephant, don't think of eating the elephant. Think of one bite at a time. Otherwise, you get all frustrated. How do you prioritize events and sticking <coughs> to the priority? When you have a priority and you stick to it, short of a real emergency, how do you stick to that priority? There's always somebody whom you know and perhaps whom you love. It could be a co-worker. 
It could be somebody that you live with. You could be related to them. That suddenly their emergency has to become your emergency. <laughs> well, that may be so. But 90% of the time, it isn't. But what happens is when you have a commitment and you have a priority and suddenly you're waylaid from that priority, you're going to be very frustrated because you know that you still have to do this, but you have taken on this other task that you should have said no had you thought about it. And how do you stick to your priorities? Short, again, short of a real emergency. What I usually tell my staff is, what's a real emergency? I want to see blood. <laughs> if there's no blood, there's no real emergency. It can wait. I, obviously, I'm, I'm exaggerating. But, but basically, not too much. Um, short of that. So the, the, the important thing is, you know, how do you stick to priorities and how do you do what you need to do? You can serve others, but I always think of the uh, airline, you know, whenever the, uh, the uh, <coughs> flight attendant uh, gives you the little speech, now it's all electronic, but uh, they say, you know, uh, in case of depressurized cabin, the mask would fall, put on your, your mask on first, and then take care of the children and those who are dependent. You have to take care of yourself first. This doesn't mean that you become you know, selfish. All it means is that for you to be more effective with others, you have to be at peace with yourself. You cannot be at peace with yourself if you're going to be upset because this is what I had to do. Now I have to do that other stuff. And now anybody that comes to me in the meanwhile is going to get my attitude because I'm taking out my nose is out of shape. So how do I take care of myself? How do I prioritize events and sticking to the priorities? Again, short of a real emergency. Beware and protect yourself from undue pressure of those who feel they're entitled to your time. And you know who they are. Everyone has somebody or some bodies that feel that they have, they are entitled to your time. They're entitled to your privacy. They're entitled to everything. They're in, in other words, you have no life. Uh, we have a, a group of retirees in the parish, and uh, with the retirees, it's very interesting. Because once a person retires, their grown children, who have children, feel that you have no life. So now you're going to be my babysitter, you're going to be my driver, you're going to be my, you know, whatever. And I always say, no, 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 you need to protect yourself. You tell them that you have projects. Then as you're able to do things, you do things for them. But don't allow people who feel that they have ownership over you or control over you to take over your life. Because that can lead to real, uh, uh, it can lead definitely to depression, but to burnout and fatigue and a lot of anger. Prioritize recreation. And recreation should be scheduled at various times during the day. By recreation, I don't mean necessarily that you want to play basketball. That too. But how do you take times during the day when you take little breaks. Um, what I do when, uh, when I had my dogs, my, my dogs passed away this past year, but uh, when I had my dogs, that was my perfect excuse. I had to walk. And it gave me, it gave me the perfect excuse in between a crazy day to take moments of 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes here and there. Now what I do is I just walk out of the office. We have a counseling room that during the day is hardly ever used. So that's where I go. I read for about five, 10 minutes, and then I get back to the office, renew, refreshed. I'm able to face more things. But in other words, how do you plan, whether recreation, whether walking, whether it is you know listening to music, whether it is lighting a candle or incense or whatever you know you do, something that is gonna get your mind, you know, how are you gonna bring some peace into your day and into your mind? various times in the day, and particularly those of you who are going to be more involved with people. There's nothing more draining, there's nothing more wonderful than dealing with people, but nothing more draining than dealing with people. Because people tend to, you know, as, especially as they have needs, they tend to want to grab onto you and they will lovingly suck the living daylights out of your life. And basically, once, there's, once there, their problems resolve, you never see them again. You only see them when they have problems, which is okay. But, but it's slight. It's the way it is. And how do you then protect yourself to make sure that you can keep some sort of sanity for the day? 
The last thing that I want to offer there is made for those of us who are uh, old or getting older. Uh, and we're all getting older, uh, I don't know if we're, we're dead. Uh, and that is, uh, how do you give, make room for memory lapses, for memory limitations? There is nothing more frustrating. I was talking to a neurologist a few days ago. And he says, you know, he says, whenever I have a senior moment, and he's in his late 40s, but he says, whenever I have a senior moment, he says, I, I don't even dwell on it. I just keep going. And eventually, within two minutes, I'll remember. But the moment that you stop and you get angry and you get upset because you have forgotten something, or there's something that I should know, it's on the tip of my tongue and I cannot get it out, you're frustrating yourself. How do you, how do you knowing, knowing your memory limitations, Avoid multitasking. I realize that I'm, I'm, this is mortal sin to say avoid multitasking because we have almost canonized. We have made it a priority that multitasking is good. Multitasking is the biggest enemy to the peace of the Spirit because we are expected to do so many things. You know, uh, men and women are supposed to be Superman and Superwoman. You know, we're supposed to do everything at all times. No. I have limitations and I can do one thing at a time. Maybe I can do many things, but usually if you notice, most multitaskers start a lot of stuff and end very few. Because multitasking really leads you to one thing. Once you've had it and you're tired, you move to the other. And then move to the other. And, and it is not good for the spirit. How do we delegate? I know it's very difficult for many people to delegate because obviously nobody can do this as well as I can. But you know, it's either your 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 health or delegate. And many times, you know, people who don't delegate, I see a lot of stress, a lot of stress that leads to, to heart attacks, that leads to cancer, that leads to a lot of other illnesses. So how do you delegate? How can you be gently assertive? By being assertive doesn't mean that you are rude. All it means is that you are clear about what you're saying. You can say it very kindly. I have to tell you a cute story that actually happened to me while I was living in Boston. While I was in Boston, um, I was referred this nun, this religious sister, for spiritual direction. And she came from Canada, and I'm, I have her permission to tell this story as long as I don't tell her name. And uh, she came from a large family. And one of the things that she had a lot of self-image um, challenges. And she always felt that she was kind of taken for granted in her family. So it was Christmas time. And I had asked her now, this is September, I had asked her to take uh, a certain <coughs> training at the local college. And she was taking these a service training sessions every week. Well, come Christmas time, she goes to the Burlington Mall right outside of Boston and she buys presents for her mother and father. She ended up the, the shopping spree very early. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. She put her packages down. She had gotten a Kit Kat bar and she was sitting at the bench, you know, one of those small benches, eating her Kit Kat bar. And this man who was sitting next to her reaches over and he grabs a piece of her Kit Kat bar and he starts eating it and she's shocked. So she looked at him, but she didn't say a thing, and she just kept eating her cake. And again, this hairy hand comes over and grabs the rest of the candy, and he just eats it. And she's stunned. So the man leaves, and he goes into uh, a coffee shop right there in the mall, and he buys, I guess, a coffee and a, and a chocolate donut, and she follows him. She decided, I'm going to be a servant. So she grabs all her packages, and she follows after him, and she looks at him and she grabs the donut from his hand and she takes a bite and now she's dressed in a habit. <laughs> she looks like a nut. So you know she takes a bite of the donut, gives it back and she goes out in a hop. As she's getting to her car and she puts the packages down to go into her purse for the car keys, there inside her purse is her Kit Kat bar. She had eaten the guy's Kit Kat bar, <laughs> and then she went ahead. So when you are to be assertive, be careful about how assertive you are. 
It's gentle assertiveness, honest and true communication in keeping with Christ-like charity. Prayer and peer support network, I think is most important. You know, I think many times we're not very discerning about friends. Now, I realize that, you know, sometimes friends come for free and we're stuck. And, you know, we inherit them from family and, uh, and, and that's fine. But how are you going to develop a network of friends that are going to be supportive? Friends that are really going to be looking out for you. Maybe they may not be your closest friends. But there will be people, it's almost like, you know, when, when people go to AA or to NA and they have a sponsor and the sponsor serves, you know, as that support system. I think we need those type of friends. We need perhaps a spiritual director, but besides that, we need that support network of support. And I think many people do not have a network of support. And many times what happens is that their friends are the very ones who are the problem. And of course, they can't go to the problem to resolve the problem. So many times then you're stuck. And you're afraid that if you do something or say something, you're going to lose your friend, who is also your problem, but it's your friend. It's kind of like a very difficult thing. So I think you know developing a, a, a support system, a network of, of uh, what we call spiritual companions or, or friends that are looking, really looking out for us. Uh, seeking fullness of healing, and that's what I'm going to talk about more now with, with the healing of uh, anger and violence. Uh, how do we uh, seek forgiveness and how do we give forgiveness? Ultimately, the whole healing of anger and violence is going to go around the whole sense of forgiving and seeking forgiveness. And that is so difficult because it's so counter our culture. That is very stuck on ourselves. And, and you know, it, the pride of our culture, which is also our pride. So with that in mind, I'd like to just begin this, this next part with a reading from uh, St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. And St. Paul says, My brothers and sisters, as chosen ones, be holy and beloved. Put on compassion and kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience, forbearing one another, and if one has to complain against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also are called to forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And above all, put on love. We'll be dealing very briefly with violence, anger, and healing personal and communal, societal challenges. I don't need to dwell on this or to pontificate on the very obvious. We live in a society that is, and a culture that is violent. We agree violence. And you know, uh, if, if you go to the doctor and if you've ever heard you know, a doctor talk about you know, a cancer that is operable or a cancer that is inoperable, you know, cancers that are inoperable or that are more challenging are the ones that are so embedded in the tissue and, and all, all engulfed within tissue that is very difficult to get through. Violence like a cancer like that is so embedded in our social norm and in our society and culture that at times we breathe it all day long that we don't even realize that we are in a culture of violence. I see that all the time, for example, when a parent tells a child that has just hit his brother or his sister, and the parent is, is, is telling him, you cannot hit your brother or your sister, as she or the father or the mother are beating the kid. You know, how do you tell a child not to beat up on their brother or sister when you're beating up on the child? You know, we don't think of it in those terms, but it is such a part of the culture that violence becomes such a part of the culture that we don't even think about it. And that's probably the, the biggest evil of, of anger and violence in our culture. 
Our families are torn by violence. Our communities are destroyed by violence. Our faith is tested by, by, by violence. This is something that we, we have experienced even more so, screamingly so, with the horrific events in Orlando in the last three weeks. How do we recognize this violence and how do we respond to it? The celebration of violence in most of our media, music, and even video games is poisoning our children because children have a very difficult time telling reality from fantasy. And in fact, when some of the children who have uh, committed violent acts are questioned, they'll say, the first thing they say is, well, I didn't know that a gun killed. Because they do this virtually in games, and they don't think of the results. They don't, they don't unless they experience that somebody is actually dying, and you can take somebody's life, it becomes a game. It's almost like an extension of a game. Beyond the violence in our streets is the violence in our own hearts. Hostility, hatred, despair, and indifference are the hearts that are growing in our culture. It's a culture of violence. Verbal violence in our families. The way that we communicate with one another. Our media, our communications, our talk shows contribute to this culture of violence. Whenever I... Um, and I do that once in a while purposely because I think we have, need to have reality orientation. I Once in a while I uh, put on the radio to a talk show with few exceptions. Who calls into the talk show? Somebody who's upset about something. And for those people who are addicted to talk shows, whether on television or on the radio, after a while you begin to believe that this is, this is reality. All this craziness, all these crazy people that are calling in, you know, and they're not even on drugs, uh, uh, you know, you begin to think, oh gee, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Because we don't have the filters, and after a while we begin to believe that this is reality. So pornography exalts the dignity of women and children and all persons and contributes to violence against them and contributes to what I'm seeing more, I would say, in the last 20 years, to the deterioration in family life. In the social swell of violence and anger, our society seems to be growing numb to human loss and suffering. Until something like Orlando happens, because it happens so close to us, and so many people that were affected there have roots here in Miami, until that happens, we hear about it somewhere else and it becomes a number. We say, isn't that awful, you know, what happened in Denver? Isn't that awful what happened in Rhode Island? But there's no connection because we see it as a number. It's almost like when, when uh, I was younger than none of you were alive yet, uh, during the Vietnam War, the, the Walter Cronkite, who was a, a, a you know, TV announcer, used to have, every night he would end his program by saying how many soldiers, how many people were killed in Vietnam. After a while, it was so overwhelming that it was just, to me, it was just a number. We didn't, we didn't pay attention anymore because it was so difficult that it, it was better to deal with it as a number than to deal with the reality of the cruelty and the horrendous happenings that were going on in the war. Uh, in the social swell of violence and anger in our society seems to be growing numb and, and people just see violence and, and victims of violence as just numbers. People who are first responders uh, often after a while, if they've been a first responder for a long time, they get a little bit calloused and, and they have to, otherwise you know, they can get very depressed, they can get suicidal. Uh, so after a while, they, they see all this horrendous stuff, and I deal with a lot of you know uh, firefighters and police officers, and there's a high rate of burnout because they're dealing with this day in day out. They seldom see the beautiful side of life. They're dealing with what we call you know the uglier side of life, the more difficult part of life. Ironically, our nation, born in a commitment to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, is haunted by death imprisoned by fear, and caught in the elusive pursuit of protection rather than happiness. Whenever I drive by a neighborhood and I see nice homes where all the doors and all the windows have bars. Now, I have nothing against bars, please, you know. I, 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 
no, no, no investment in this. But I, I wonder, this is done for protection. So that means that the hoodlums are free and the good people are behind bars. Think about it. We live in a society where if you are law-abiding and you're trying to be good, you, you imprison yourself so that all the crazies can run around free. You know, instead of banding together as a society for the good of society. Because I believe firmly, and I don't think I'm Pollyanna, I believe firmly that the majority of the world, the majority of our nation is good and good at heart. But I think fear really pushes us into a corner where we should never be. We should never allow truth and goodness and right and justice to be cowered by violence and by anger. But unfortunately, you know, we anger and violence gathers force and the good people scurry, almost like roaches when the lights get turned on in their home. I firmly believe that we as a society can turn away from violence, that we can build communities of greater peace, but it begins with a clear conviction and a respect for life, all life, from the moment of natural conception to the moment of natural death. All life. How do we respect life? It's, it's really interesting how often we pick and choose. It's almost like what I call you know, the, the public's mentality. We pick and choose what we want to protect. So I like puppies. So my heart goes out to puppies. And if the puppy is abused, I get all riled up. But I don't get riled up when maybe an elderly person or a child, you know, may, I may look the other way. You know, so, so how do we uh, keep the intent of that sanctity, the holiness of life, from beginning to end? that only the, the higher power, the Almighty, the, only the Lord has power over life. We have no power over taking life. Respect for life is not just a slogan or a program. It is a fundamental moral principle flowing from the teachings of the dignity of the human person. It, it is an approach that people are valued more than things. I know that this seems very obvious, but you'd be surprised how often people are expendable in some people's eyes. Money becomes more important. If I can sacrifice somebody, if I can, if I work, you know, I can stab somebody in the back so I can get ahead, I will do that. You know, how often we don't really, um, really love life and respect life. You know, how often even in our own families, I, I always tell the, the elderly folks, you know, especially as they're getting ready for, for uh, to meet the Lord, you know, I always tell them, you know, your money's spend while you're alive, or your money's give it to some charity anywhere. But if you leave $50 and you have three kids, they'll be fighting over $50 and probably not talk to each other ever again over $50. Mm -hmm. Because money, for some reason, you know, that all saying that money is a root of all evil. It's a necessary evil, but it's a root of all evil. How, how do we obviously sometimes prize things more than people? Respect for life must guide the choices we make as individuals and as a society. What we do and what we do not do. What we value and what we consume. Whom we admire and those and, and whose example we follow and who we support and what we oppose. I find it fascinating whether it's in the, uh, you know, I, I have Yahoo as my home page, and you have all, for those of you who are familiar with Yahoo, they have all these news items, and it's mostly celebrities, and, and it's really interesting. All these people that everybody should admire and look up to are so superficial. You know, they're admired because they're, they're fashionable, or because they have money, or because of the latest scandal. But they're not necessarily admired because they have done something good for society. Or they have done something good for the world, or they have done something good even for their own family. But how often we, you know, who do we place as our heroes? Who are the people that we look up to? You know, and our society is getting more and more superficial. 
you know, and, and, and we just admire all these people, and I'm not going to name any names because I could name many. But uh, even some of the, the comedians, you know, and, and some of the uh, people that have uh, television shows, and the things and the people that they bring in, you know, what, what are the, who are these people and what are they doing, and why is it that we look up to them, and what in society makes us look up to them? Respect for human life is the starting point for confronting a culture of violence. Once I respect human life, Suddenly, some of the things that we would do, or that we would look the other way, or that we would be turned up, numb to, suddenly we would have to look at as it is, as somebody is being hurt, somebody that is that is doing this work, or somebody that you know. We, we tend to look at uh, uh, child pornography, or we tend to look at the the, the sale of you know uh, uh, sex slaves, and we say, well, it's so prominent. What can we do about it? No, but, but if we took the, the conscience and if we looked at each one of those things and tried to do something within our own realm of possibilities. You know, it reminds me of the story of the, uh, the little boy that was going, uh, he was walking through the sh seashore and all these starfish had washed ashore <laughs> and it was just, the sun was beginning to break. And the little boy got panicked because he knew that as soon as the sun would hit this, the, the, the uh, starfish, they would just die. So he just started frantically throwing the starfish back into the water. Well, there was an old man at the pier looking down at the boy doing all this frantic work. And the, and the man finally couldn't help him. He says, boy, what are you doing? He says, I'm saving the starfish. He says, forget it. There are too many of them. You're not going to be able to do anything about them. And he says, I'll be able to do something about this one. You know, how often, you know, we're so overwhelmed about the problems of the world that we end up doing absolutely nothing. Instead of being able to say, okay, I may not be able to do a lot for many people, but I can do something for this one. And this one, in turn, may be able to do for that one. And before you know it, you have started a chain reaction of, of goodness and conscience and openness and peace and reconciliation. Respect for human life, for all of life, cannot be compromised. This task deserves and demands full commitment from each one of us. Words cannot stop weapons. Statements will not control hatred. Only commitment and conversion can change us, and together we can change our culture, our communities, our families, ourselves. One of the greatest uh, people in the 20th century that, that did this was Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi, everybody thought he was crazy because he saw the problems <laughs> and he decided he wasn't going to get crowds of people to do anything. He started himself by going on a hunger strike, by being present at some place where he should not have been present, by giving witness in the midst of violence, for him to be there and to even, even take sometimes some of the beatings to the point that since he was not striking back, it would make people be violent very frustrated because a person who is violent wants violence back so that they have a reason to be more violent. But when suddenly that violence is being absorbed, that can be very frustrating. But that's also the beginning of the making of peace person by person, family by family, neighborhood by neighborhood. This is not going to happen nationally. We expect to elect a president or to have a Congress or to have justices that are going to bring this about. It has to be brought about first by ourselves in our own hearts. How do we bring about and allow, allow the Lord to place peace in our hearts when we are troubled, when we are angry, when we're frustrated, you know, when we're fatigued? How do we allow peace to enter our hearts. If we're not at peace, we cannot be instruments of peace to others. So person by person, family by family, neighborhood by neighborhood, we must take our communities back from the evil and fear that they face when they face the violence that they're into. We believe our faith in Christ as a Christian, and when I say I'm going to use Catholic and Christian very interchangeably, so uh, bear with me. 
Uh, we believe that our faith as Christians, uh, in our values, our vision, our hope, we can bring an important measure of peace to our hearts, to our homes, and to our streets. Our culture of violence manifests itself in many different ways. Two decades ago, the Kerner Commission called violence as American as apple pie. Sadly, this provocative statement has proved to be prophetic, unfortunately. No nation on earth except those in the midst of war has as much violent behavior as we do in our own country, in our homes, in our televisions, in our internet, and in our streets. Subsequent studies in the past 10 years by the Pew Research and reports from the Office of the United States Attorney General not only have confirmed but have given more detailed statistics on the problem that we face. For the sake of time, I hope to be able to address all these in a more detail, perhaps maybe in a future gathering. I will concentrate on just a couple of these concerns. The most violent place in America, believe it or not, is not our streets. It's our homes. More than 50% of the women murdered in the United States are killed by their partners or their ex-partners. Millions of children are victims of family violence. It is now estimated that 14 American children die every single day from gun incidents. Gunshots cause one out of every four deaths among American, American teenagers. Our entertainment media too often exaggerates and even celebrates violence. Children see an average, this, this came out, this is from the United States uh, uh, Census Bureau. Children see an average of 8,000 murders and 100,000 other acts of violence on television before they begin elementary school. The violence of abortion has destroyed more than 34 million unborn children since 1972. In the last 10 years, the divorce rate has held steady at 48%. More than half of these are bitter, angry, and even violent parties. And as I always tell couples that are divorcing, I said, you know, for God's sake, if you're not smart, at least be wise. You're going to be stuck for the rest of your lives because of children. If you have children, you're going to be stuck for the rest of your lives together. Unless somehow you want to divorce your children. That's another option. But short of that, your children are going to have children. So until you die, you're going to be stuck going to family gatherings and to celebrations together. You have a choice. Either you can be at peace and be there as a piece of your family, or your kids are going to think twice about inviting mom and dad in World War III and start anyway every time they come in. So, you know, the, the, behind all these numbers are human tragedies, lives lost, families destroyed, children without real hope. It's really interesting. I was um, talking at a, at a school recently. And I, I asked the kids, this is seventh grade kids, and I asked the kids, you know, one of the questions was, what are you going to do when you grow up? And the first child was a, a young woman, very bright, and she says, if I grow up. Very interesting. Not when I grow up. If I grow up. She had been brought up with so much violence, seeing friends of hers killed. That, that, you know, when, when, when the innocence of children is dashed and we have lost hope, violence in our culture is fed by multiple forces. The disintegration of family life, media influences, growing substance abuse, the availability of so many weapons, and the rise of gangs and increasing youth, youth violence. No one response can address the diverse sources and there is no magic. Uh, and answer to any of these. Traditional, liberal, or conservative approaches cannot effectively confront them unless somehow we confront them in our own lives, within our own hearts. We have to address simultaneously declining family life and the increasing availability of deadly weapons, the lure of gangs and the slavery of addictions, the absence of real opportunity, budget cuts adversely affecting the poor, and the loss of moral values. And what is saddest in all this is that a lot of the violence and a lot of the, uh, the calamity that comes with it is more prominent among the poor. 
the poor are the ones that the first ones to lose hope and the first ones to opt for violence if it means getting something or the only way of getting something. While we are affected by violence, violence particularly ravages poor communities. In some communities, teens talk, as I mentioned, about if they grow up rather than when. We even fight violence with violence, severe punishment and death penalties, which in the long run, death penalties have not in any way minimized violence. Violence has increased. So what, what are creative ways that we can use to minimize violence rather than using violence to kill violence? A society which destroys its children, abandons its old, and relies on vengeance fails fundamental moral tests. How do we teach our young to curb their violence when we embrace it as a solution to social problems? We cannot teach that killing is wrong by killing. We oppose both the violence of abortion and the use of violence to oppose abortion. Violence is not justified in either case, in any case. We must affirm and protect all of life, especially the most vulnerable in our midst. In short, we often fail to value life and cherish human beings above possessions, power, or pleasure. Less obvious and less visible are the slow motion violence of discrimination and poverty, hunger and hopelessness, addiction and self-destructive behavior. The deterioration of family life and the loss of community leave also many without moral direction or personal roots. I was giving a talk recently in Overtown, and a lot of the people that came to the talk were a lot of the elderly, who feel very disfranchised because they feel that as some of their children or grandchildren have grown up and have gotten educations, they have left. They have moved, like everybody else, to the suburbs, and nobody comes back to serve them. You know, many times we, we, we do well and we leave. We fail to come back to help our own. The deterioration of family life and the loss of community leave too many without moral direction or personal roots. As we recognize the anger and violence that surrounds us, we can easily be overwhelmed with a sense of defeat. What can we do? What can I do? And I think that we need to, this is what we need to ponder on first. What can I do for myself? How can I open my heart and my life to peace and to be an instrument of peace to others? What are the triggers? You know, I, I say this to many folks that come in for pastoral counseling. When you get angry, what are the triggers? You need to be aware. What makes you angry? And then don't react. Otherwise, we spend our entire life reacting to people. And you know. I don't need to tell you. You know exactly who are the people that have those magical fingers that can push the buttons that can get you going. That all they have to say is one word, and it got you going. Well, that, once you know that that is that person or that situation is your trigger, you're going to need to be aware. I'm going to meet with so-and-so. I'm going to be in this situation that always triggers you. So you know what? I am not going to allow it to have power over me. I am not going to give it that power. And how do we begin to open ourselves to being not only instruments of peace, but becoming instruments of peace to ourselves? As we recognize the anger and violence that surround us, we can easily be overwhelmed. That's why we need to be able to not look at the whole picture. But having a whole picture in the back of our minds, we need to address what are the issues that I need to address before getting overwhelmed. Our faith in the Lord gives us the peace that we need in the midst of the storm that surrounds us. I always say to folks, belief in God does not mean that I'm going to go through a charmed life unscathed. It ain't going to happen. Life happens. And life at times can be very cruel. Belief in the Lord only assures us that no matter where we are at, no matter the messiness that we may find ourselves in, somehow we're going to be receiving all the grace, all the strength, all the peace that we need if we open our hearts to it. Life is like a hurricane. 
But for those of you who have been in Florida long enough, you realize that hurricanes have a center, which is called the eye. And in the center of this cyclone, there's peace. Opening our hearts to faith, whatever our faith may be, opening our hearts to the Lord places us in that eye. So that all around us, it's totally insane. But it's not going to touch us. And if it touches us, we may be a little bit shop-worn, but we're not going to be destroyed. Because we're going to receive all that we need to remain in peace. Our faith in the Lord gives us that peace that we need in the midst of the storm that surrounds us. It is this very faith lived that gives us hope that with God all things are possible. We might not be able to solve our society's problems altogether, but we can do our own part in our own hearts. We can be instruments of peace to our families, to our neighborhoods, to our communities, and to our workplaces. Even if we are not yet there and convinced about hope for healing or anger or violence in our culture, we must repeat to ourselves the conviction that comes from our faith and from scriptures. There is a saying that uh, from Alcoholics Anonymous that I always thought was a little bit strange. And the older I get, the more I realize the wisdom in it. And Alcoholics Anonymous has a saying that says, Fake it until you make it. In other words, if I know something to be true, but I'm not yet convinced, I keep repeating it and repeating it and repeating it until it percolates down and I begin to really be convinced about that which I know is true. Well, even if I am convinced that, oh, what can I do about this violence? It's everywhere. I keep repeating the Lord can work this in my own heart. I can be the beginning of this peace in my family. I can be the beginning of peace in the place where I work. Even in small ways. It's really amazing. Uh, there's this uh, lady that came to me recently and she says uh, she had gone through a great conversion in her own life, um, lived a crazy life before, and uh, she is happier than she's ever been and she's very much at peace. And she brought a few people from work uh, for different activities in the church. And it's really funny because the folks that she brought in said, well, we wanted to come here because we wanted to get something of what she got. They didn't know what she got. But they know that she now is different and she's happier and she has brought some goodness to the office where there was before it was like, How do we begin to be those sources for our families and for the places where we work and where we live and where we study? God's wisdom and love and commandments can show us a way to live, to heal, and to reconcile. And it's really interesting, if you look at the scriptures, you know, sometimes we tend to, uh, as Christians, you know, we tend to think at times that the, the uh, Testament of the Hebrews was a little bit violent. And, and you need to realize that, that as the teachings, you know, as God teaches his people, uh, there's a progression uh, that of education in the faith and in goodness. Uh, the Lex Talion, you know, the, the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which is from the from the testament of the Hebrews, you, you tend to think that's that's barbaric. No. In the times before the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, if you went to my village and you killed a sheep that belonged to me, I could go into your village and kill your entire village. But now, with the new law, Lex Talion, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, if you went to my village and you killed my sheep, I could go into your village, but I could only kill one of your sheep. That's a great progress. Now you don't have to kill the whole village, just one sheep will do. So you see how eventually when the Lord Jesus comes along and he says, you have heard it say, love those who love you. I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. So that is a whole, you know, the, the tradition is unbroken. 
And it's that progression of the revelation of God who is all goodness. God who is judge, but who is also you know, merciful and compassionate. Our faith challenges each one of us to examine how we can contribute to an ethic which cherishes life and puts people before things and values kindness and compassion over anger and vengeance. A growing sense of national fear and failure must be replaced by a new commitment to solidarity and common good. You know, it's really interesting. Good news travels very slowly. Bad news like wildfire. People are always open and more willing to believe the bad than the good. That's why, you know, gossip about somebody. You know, when, when, when folks come in and say, oh, Father, I don't need to go to confession because I haven't killed anyone. I said, well, no, but your tongue has. <laughs> you know, we do a lot of damage with our tongues. We can destroy somebody's reputation. We may not kill them with a weapon, but we have a wonderful weapon, you know. So the thing is, you know, how do we become aware of what are the ways that we, even without realizing, you know, we, we are violent to one another? What we believe, where we are, how we live out our life and our faith can make a great difference in the struggle against violence. Our assets in this challenge include the examples of good teachers, for us as Christians, Jesus is the, the, the primary teacher. The biblical values of respect for life and peace, and justice, and community. And prayer. You know, there is no worse thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm quoting this, and I don't know where I'm quoting it from, so uh, you know, file it away. The, the life that is not worth living is a life that is not examined. How often we go from, from activity to activity, from thing to thing, without even giving it a thought. You know, to analyze, why am I doing this? Why did I say this? Why did I not say this? Or why did I not say it in such a way? Sometimes it's not what we say or we don't say it, it's how we say it. How we do things. A commitment to marriage and family. I think that, that as a society, and particularly yourselves in, in, in your own fields, I know in my own field as, as a priest, uh, family life is under attack constantly. How do we foster family? How are we, it doesn't matter how the family is configured. But how do we, you know, support? And how do we, you know, allow safe spaces for families to grow together? For families to, for, for a family place, a family life to be a place of peace and a place of safety. A place where people can really grow. You cannot really grow when you are constantly defending yourself. Uh, a presence in the community serving as a source of hope, promoting an ethics that promotes virtue, responsibility, forgiveness, generosity, concern for others, social justice, and economic fairness. You know, it, it, it's really interesting. Uh, when I'm in the uh, relation, community relations board for the for the city of Miami and for the county, uh, you know, the amount of people that are doing wonderful things is really amazing. You don't hear about it. All you hear is a crime. All that comes into the front page of the newspaper and, 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 and the TV is all, all, the, all the nasty things. The, and maybe that is a good sign. Maybe the day that the goodness becomes news, we're in trouble. But you know what? I, I've been blessed for so many years to be in the Community Relations Board because you've seen people, and it doesn't matter, the race, the language group, the culture group, the amount of goodness that is happening in South Florida that you never hear about. The amount of people that go out of their way to serve others, to be there for this, to, to, you know, to do things that are really heroic, that you never really hear about. Promoting an ethics that promotes virtue and responsibility, advocacy for better values, better policies, and social responsibility. That whatever I do for somebody else, I'm ultimately doing it for myself. If I'm promoting goodness and justice and fairness and, and really a, a good community that gathers together for good, that ultimately is going to help me. It's 
can I help my family? Supporting community approaches to crime prevention. Pursuit, not, not hiding, but actually coming forth to be able to say to those that were, were you know, proliferate, to be able to say, no, not here. We will not stand up for this. And if enough people do that, if enough goodness is shown up, evil goes away. You know, it, it's almost like a, 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 when, when you have darkness, when the power goes out, even just the lighting of a match makes a big difference. Just a little bit of light. And if everybody brings a little bit of light, how much will that illuminate and the brightness? Supporting community approaches to crime prevention, pursuing swift and, and effective justice without vengeance. Discover and work on resolving root causes for crime and violence, for poverty and substance abuse, for racism, family disintegration. Not just putting stopgap measures. You know, we throw money at situations instead of really trying to help persons. So, you know, there's poverty or there's, let's put in some money for this. Let's give them a, it's a band-aid, another band-aid. But how often do we really go to the root? You know, it's not a matter of giving a fish, but it's teaching someone to fish. You know, it's not a matter of just giving a handout to keep people at bay and at peace, but it's a matter of how do we assist people to have dignity for themselves and be proud of where they're at. Pursuing economic justice, especially employment. Schools that reflect values. You know, in, in South Florida, this is very evident, I'm sure you're all very aware of this, the proliferation in South Florida of magnet schools and special schools, and, and everybody who has any type of government is sending their kids either to private school or to all these particular schools. Well, <coughs> then the average public school remains as the dregs. I went to Coral Gables High. When I went there, I remember, of course, this is uh, you know in, in the days of the uh, of the dinosaurs. But I remember that you know if we had a problem, we went to a teacher, whether they were a Catholic, whether they were you know of any other Christian denomination, whether they were Jewish, no matter it doesn't matter who it was, who we sit down with them, they would talk to us, they would read the scriptures, maybe a psalm or something to us, and it was a one to one. Now I go back, I go back every year. Every year I go back, the school is more highly armed. There's metal detectors, there's police in every floor, there's a proliferation of police. And there's still, there was murder there last year. So you know, more security is not going to guarantee more peace if the peace doesn't come from our hearts and doesn't emanate from our hearts and our institutions. You know, do we promote even in our education, or is it just we decide we're going to bail out and go to all these other schools? And meanwhile, what do we do with the, with the ones that cannot afford or cannot send their kids to another school? Pursuing economic justice, schools that reflect values, overcoming tragedy of family violence, and strengthening families and family life. In general, to, to end. Anger in itself it's not a sin. Anger in itself is not necessarily wrong. Anger sometimes moves us to do something. Anger helps us discern that this is right and this is wrong. And this is, there's no gray right area. This is right or wrong. But how do we act on that anger can get us into trouble and can create a sense of anger and violence. If anger is just a feeling that promotes me and propels me to do something and to get off my job and do something good, then praise God, anger has worked for the good. Remember that passage of Jesus when he goes to the temple and he kicks everybody out of the temple with whips? That's what we call righteous anger. But it's really interesting, you know, even in that passage, if you ever go back to the passages, I think it's fascinating. He is harshest with the ones who are changing monies. And those who are selling the big animals who are making both boku bucks on, 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 the, on the poor. The ones that are selling the pigeons and they're making just pennies, he says to them very quietly, just get them out of here. Get them out of here. 
So anger as an emotion and feeling is not simple in itself as long as we do not allow it to take over our action. Biblical view of anger helps us to focus on the good. Unforgiveness is the cancer of the soul. Notice that things that we fret about, things that keep us from a good night's sleep, things that we rev over and over again, past hurts that we continue to be living, and we allow to keep having power over us, all those things, that unforgiveness, bring stress, fatigue, burnout, violence, and it becomes a vicious circle. How do we allow, through prayer and through all the things that we have discussed, how do we allow this releasing of anger to yield to forgiveness? <coughs> what are the barriers that keep us from forgiveness? We need to look at those. Why do I fail to forgive somebody? And you know, I was talking to a person a few years ago that was revving about a situation that happened in his life and he was, every time he thought about it, he would see he was so angry. It was reliving the hurt all over again. And I was trying to get him to, you know, you need to forgive. Forgiving doesn't mean that you're doing a favor to that person. You're doing a favor to yourself because you're not allowing that person to keep hurting you. So, he says, but I can't. I can't do that yet. So I, I finally said, you know, after going back and forth a long time, I said, well, do you know that you have to do it? Oh yeah, but I'm not ready yet. I said, okay. Let me ask you this. Are you at least sorry that you're not sorry? I said, what? He says, well, are you sorry? You know that you should be doing it, but you're not doing it. Are you sorry that you're not? Oh yeah, I guess so. Okay, that's a start. At least you're prying the door open. Just a bit. So that somehow the Spirit of God can get in there and do what we cannot do. How do we allow, there's no way that the Spirit of God can work in us this forgiveness and this peace unless we allow it. Otherwise it's going to be like, okay, do it. I dare you. It's not going to happen. Continuing the process. The process of making peace is a process of a lifetime. When you think that you've done everything, life will continue. There will be more people that will come your way that will bring their problems and try to make their problems your problems. And you're going to have to be dealing with this constantly. So how do you begin to build a discipline about this in yourselves? And it is a difficult task, but not an impossible one. Forgiveness to ask the Lord to make your love more perfect each day, as imperfect as it is here. Forgiving the self, and that's something that we at times overlook. In the whole process of forgiveness, which is the only thing that brings healing to violence and to anger, the first person we need to forgive is ourselves. And I think often when we're doing spiritual direction or counseling, uh, if the counselor or the spiritual director has not gone to the point where they have forgiven themselves and given themselves over to the Lord, we're not going to be affected. Because we're going to carry all our problems onto somebody else. Or take on those problems and there's going to be a lot of transparency. How do we begin by forgiving ourselves? If we want to be whole, which by the way is where holy comes from, if we want to be whole and free and stand fully in the beauty of God's presence, we need to release this anger. We need to forgive. We need to likewise confess and receive forgiveness. And again, as I said, these things are not easy, but they're not difficult because we can do all things. St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. We can do all things through Him that strengthens us. And I'd like to end 
begin with the letter from St. Paul to the Colossians. Above all then, my brothers and sisters, as God chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on kindness and compassion, lowliness and meanness, patience, forbearing one another, and if one has complained against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And of all these things, put on love, which binds <coughs> everything together in perfect harmony. Any observations or questions or... Don't be shy. Yes? Earlier when you had um, mentioned that quote, it, it was from Plato's Apology. Uh, um, on examined life. Great. You looked it up. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is a wonderful thing about having a telephone. <laughs> Thank you. I couldn't have been that clear. <laughs> Any questions or clarifications or anything I said that was that clear? Yes. I want to know what have been doing in the church for contribution of all this society less? More. Well, I, I think it depends, I guess, each community is, the church in general is constantly, that's a thrust. The thrust, if the thrust is to evangelize, is how do we become the best of humanity? By becoming the best of humanity, we're, we're bringing out the most godly. Because, you know, uh, we believe in, in, in our faith that the Lord Jesus became human so that we could become holy and divine. As he, as he is. So he brings forth. So that's the whole thrust of, of the church. All churches, whether you are uh, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, the, the thrust of, of faith is really to make you whole. Now, each community has different gifts. Um, in, in our parish, I would say there are many, many gifts, things we've got, but uh, I would say our greatest gift would be our outreach to the poor. And, and uh, we have outreach not only to homeless, but outreach also to migrants, uh, to minority communities. Uh, and it's not a matter of handouts, but it's a matter of education um, in many different levels. It's a matter of counseling. It's a matter of, um, we have a, a group of folks um, called in Spanish padrinos, which means uh, godparents. And with the excuse of going into uh, the home of a lot of the poor folks who are trying to get their children baptized, that's the excuse. We get in there, so it gives them a chance to look at the household. Um, sometimes some of these uh, women marry so young, and they have children so young, and they don't know much about nutrition or hygiene, or so it's a way to it's a way to also uh, for for the men who are involved in this ministry to go to the to the uh, uh, father of the household and say, you know, you don't have to spend half of your paycheck on beer. You know, it, it, there's other things in life. You know, and, and there are many different ways of. So before you actually share faith, uh, it's really interesting. Jesus, before he preached, he would feed people or he would heal. People. You know, you have to take care of the body before you take care of the soul. And that's why, you know, this gathering is so, is so important because, you know, it's not a matter of a healthy mind. It has to be a healthy mind, a healthy body, a healthy spirit. It all goes, we are not disjointed, you know. We are one whole. And how do we address the whole, you know. So each, each parish, hopefully in each community, would, would address something. And, and uh, each one has different gifts. And I think, you know, it's important, and I'm glad you asked that question, because I think it's important that as you get more into your own field, especially with mental health, that you begin to become familiar with faith communities in your area where you're working, so that as people come to you, no matter the faith, or perhaps even no affiliation, that you can say, what are the, the, the um, links that can help, you know, that, that can be support group for them? Um, we have in our in our parish. We also have a couple uh, a narcotics anonymous group and alcoholics anonymous and, and Al Anon and Alateen. And so there's a lot of support groups uh, that, and we have a lot of people coming that are not 
Catholics who are not parishioners, but anyone, everyone is welcome. So I think it's, it's important, just like for us, it's important to know, um, I have sent people here to the Good Clinic. Uh, you know, there, there are times that, that, you know, I need to find out what are the resources in the area. Uh, so so I, it, it's most important that we're able to work together in the community. And what, if, if my gift is this, then send people to me for this, as I will send people to you for that. Because many times what happens is a, a, a institution wants to do everything and they end up doing nothing well. You need to excel in something. I remember when uh, Mother Teresa came to Miami in 1983 and she wanted to set up a home for homeless mothers um, with, uh, with little children. The architect at the time had asked her, he says, Mother, would you open a, a um, a place for, for AIDS victims. And she said to the other, says, you know, says, that's a wonderful work, but not what we do. So you need to get somebody to do that and do it well. This is what we do well. So we need to know what, what are our gifts? What, what is it that we do well and do it? Because sometimes we spread ourselves so thin that we end up doing nothing really well. So, you know, what are the things that we can do? And then we can share, you know, and I think it's most important in the community to be able to share, to be aware of what you're doing. We have in our, um, within our parish area, we have a few um, Christian churches, not, not Catholic, but other Christian churches. We have a synagogue and we have an, uh, a mosque. And I'm very aware of what, what they're doing and what their contacts are so that we can share that. Um, I think it's, it's important. So thank you for asking that question. Yes. Um, I don't know if we um, had this subject, but about family anger. Have you heard about families that are angry, generations passes by, and they, at the end you don't even know why they're angry between cousins and uncles and all that. And it's really hard because when you come from a big family trying to put peace between them, it's... it's, it's we, thank you for bringing up. You know, um, I just had that yesterday. We had a... Um, really sad situation where a couple in their 60s, husband and wife, uh, had a tragic car accident and they both died. So it, it's, I, I, we seldom get a funeral where you have the caskets, you know, side by side. Um, but times like funerals are perfect times, pastorally, to be able to address this. To be able to say, you know, Life is such a precious gift, and we waste so much of it. Playing games. If she's going to be there, I'm not going to go because I don't want to see her. You know, I, I always say to folks, if today were my last day, if I knew that today was going to be my last day, and I'm going to die tonight, would I think that some of the things that worry me and upset me now, would I still be worried and upset? I can assure you, not really. Half of the people that, that I have given power over me, and that I have refused to, to, to talk to. And sometimes if you say, after generations, you don't even know why you're upset. Mm -hmm. That's foolishness. It's foolishness. Because, you know, we, we, we play all these games, and that's all it is. It's, 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 it's silly, silly, silly games. And when you realize how precious I've been, and, and if this were my last day, I want to be remembered as a good person, if nothing else. I want to be able to say, you know, I go without regrets. I see that often, I, and I've been privileged, and it is a privilege, to be at the bedside of somebody who's died. And over and over and over again, I see the same thing. People that should be dead, but refuse to die until they see so-and-so that they haven't talked to in ages, or they were upset until they are at peace. And sometimes we have to drag the other person in because they have refused no, because I, he's going to get upset or she's going to get upset. No, no. I have seen people hold on to life for days until somebody comes from New York or wherever because they need to make that peace. So, you know, it's... Uh, and those are the times, unfortunately, it takes something tragic to address that so that people stop playing games. And that's all it is. It's, it's dumb game. Can you elaborate a little bit about, um, because people I think, tend to think, well, if you forgive somebody, you forget. You know, they think it's just forgive and forget. And, you know, so 
they won't re they won't release it. They won't release the anger because so well, you know, if I forgive this person, then they can come into my life. I've heard this in couples therapy all the time and in family therapy. Then they can come into my life and things are just gonna pick up as they were before. And that's really not the case. So can you elaborate a little bit about how forgiveness is really about releasing and, and right. letting it go and, and that's an excellent excellent uh, point um, first of all at no time for those of you who are Christians at no time did the Lord Jesus ever say forgive and forget we're not computers you can't delete you know we have memories and the memories will remain there forgiveness is one thing Forgetting is something else. If you happen to forget because you get Alzheimer's or you know you have dementia, praise Jesus. But you know, but uh, otherwise you're going to remember. And you know what? Remembering is not bad. If you have been burnt, and then you see fire, and you put your hand there again. You need to be burnt again. You're stupid enough to do that. But you need to remember fire burns. So you know that some people are fire to you. And you're going to forgive that person because you need to release that anger. And you need to be at peace. But you know that you need to stay away from that person as much as possible. I've forgiven you, but you know what? You remain in Timbuktu and I'm here. You know, we, we often don't think about this. You would not think, unless you're suicidal, you would not think of going home and taking poison. Because it kills you. But how often we take people who are poison to us and we feel that we have to put up with them. No. People who don't bring out the best in us, we need to keep at bay. And if we can't, because we happen to be related to them, like we're their children or you know their relative or their spouse, we need to be able to, how do we measure in the dosage? I always say, you know, God created this wonderful thing called the ID call on the phone. <laughs> So somebody's calling, and I know who is calling, and I realize, oh no, no, I took my dosage already with this person today, no. Let it go into my answering service, I'll answer the call tomorrow or next day. I need to, you know, because most of the time, it's silly stuff. It's not like they're calling to tell you something earth-shaking or important. It's something to stir the, the stuff, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I think the fact that you forgive doesn't mean that you go back to the old ways. And this is where you need to be very, very clear, you know, and this is where you need to have, you know, a, a good sense of self to be able to say, no, 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 I have forgiven you, but I am not a doormat. I am precious in the sight of God, made to the image and likeness of God, and therefore, no, I will not allow you to use and, you know, and, and sometimes it takes practice because, you know, people that have, when you have already built a relationship, especially relationships that are very dysfunctional, it's very difficult to heal a dysfunctional relationship. And sometimes one party wants to heal it, but the other party just wants to go back to the, what they're accustomed to. And you need to constantly be able, maybe at times, the best thing to do is keep them very much at bay until they finally get the message, no, no, it's not business as usual. Things have changed. And if you don't want to accept it, then, you know, my heart goes out to you, but no. Because basically, ultimately, by forgiving somebody, what we're doing is we're allowing the Lord to work in us. We're doing ourselves a favor, not anybody else. We're really freeing ourselves from that grip that, that makes the hurt all over again every time we think about it. And by the way, we know we have forgiven, not forgotten, but we know we have forgiven when you can be in the presence of the person who has hurt you. And it will be as impactful as me looking at these classes. It's a process, it takes a long time. Sometimes it takes years before you can come to that. But until you, you know that you have forgiven somebody fully when you can be in the presence of the person who has hurt you, and you basically say, good luck. Can you speak up? Thank you, Monsignor. Um, 
because you know I've heard this a lot, and, and, and so I think it's, it's it would be great to clear clear it up for people when when people say when, when Christians say you know people are talking to you and they're telling you about this person has hurt me or this person has done this or that or that and and a lot of the times you know we say pray for that person and you know you get the rolling of the eyes sometimes or you get you know, and what do you mean pray for that person? They're trying to hurt me. They're trying to, you know, do things to me. Why should I pray for them when they're trying to do? Can you explain what that means? Yeah, it, it, that's very good. I, that means, that has a, a lot of depth of meaning. First of all, when I pray for somebody who has hurt me, which is what the Lord has asked me to do, what I'm doing is I'm allowing the Lord to begin to help me. When I'm praying for somebody, I'm keeping that person's name in mind and in heart and giving it to the Lord. I am not praying so that he or she may continue to hurt or may continue to be the, 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 the bad person or whatever. No, no. All I'm saying is, Lord, I need your healing. And I need for you to heal me. So when I'm praying for somebody, basically, I'm basically saying, Lord, obviously, I have not been able to do anything you know, to change this person. This person has not done anything, so now the, you're the only one who can do something. So you change it. Ultimately, what we're saying is, you know what? Only God does wholesale. We do retail. So we don't worry about the big stuff. We let God worry about the big stuff. We worry about the little stuff. That's it. That's more than that. The problem is that often we like to do wholesale. And that's when we get into the problem. We say we try to control we can control things. Thank you. Anyone else before we can... What time is it now? Okay, don't worry about that. No, Any other questions? Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Monsignor. Um, you know, the spirituality series is something that's going to continue. Um, we're hoping to have a, a rabbi in the next couple of months. Um, one of the things, um, we did want to do that, I want to thank um, the sponsors, the faculty, the staff, everyone that's come, the administration, who's been very, very supportive. Um, and uh, particularly for this presentation, we've had, you know, um, the Alvisu University Catholic Club, the Division 36 Society uh, for the Psychology of Religion and Spirituality, the APA Division, um, the PhD in Human Services has been very supportive, uh, the Goodman Center. So, you know, really, truly, this is something that's the beginning. It's growing. Um, any of you, we do have the, the Division 36 Student Club. I'm a faculty advisor for that. We have the Alvisu University Catholic Club for the first time also. I'm the faculty advisor for that. We will be having meetings. All of you can truly, truly be a part of this um, because the American Psychological Association was very clear uh, three years ago at the APA conference. Doctoral programs across the country. This is not a, a now Alvisu University issue. This is a nationwide issue. Um, we're not doing a good job uh, preparing students to be culturally sensitive, culturally, culturally competent to, um, regarding uh, religion and spiritual diversity. It's something that, um, you know, in, 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 our, in, our, in, our, in our lives, in our, as we were growing up, I mean, they would say, when you go to an, a function, what don't you talk about? You know, religion and politics, right? And it seemed to have seeped into our profession. Um, and, and this presentation that APA gave, you know, it was, it was, it was very, it was an eye-opening experience for me and for, and for others that 50% of clinical supervisors do not ask the practical students to ask the family if they have any faith. Think about it. 50% of clinical supervisors do not ask the, the students that they're supervising if the client has any type of faith. And if they do, they check it off and then they move on. And we have said this before, those of you that have, have had me in my classes, and we've spoken about it, and Monsignor has been here also, 
You know, not only do you have to, the top three things people turn to in a time of crisis are what? Family, <coughs> friends, and faith. This is not Dr. Alonso saying it. This is research saying it. Top three things people turn to, family, friends, and faith, in no given order. We're an afterthought, mental health counselors and human service professionals. They come to us after the fact, sometimes. If not, think about it in your life. When the last time you had a crisis, who did you turn to? Did you turn to family? Did you turn to your faith? Did you turn to your friends? How many of you turned to a mental health professional? Very few, probably. So, as, as a university, as a program, as a, a, a training institution, we've got to catch up. Okay? And we have started to do this. And, and I'm very proud to say we have, we, the, our history part is amazing. Look at the word he uses, love. Love reaches beyond knowledge. A lot of people didn't quite get that. But we, we have to be very, very um, proud that we've come from an institution and that we're studying an institution that started that way. And we have to continue moving in that direction. And, you know, three years after this ABA conference, three years ago, we have been implementing this uh, more about religion and spiritual diversity and training at the clinic, in some of my classes, in some of the other classes. Now this is the first time that we're really doing it this year, institutionally, and bringing these different religious leaders to speak to us and offer the opportunity for students and faculty and staff to ask questions. And this is a nice little group. Next year it'll be a bigger group, and the year and it'll be a full house. And our community leaders around it in the community will also be involved. So one thing before you go, Monsignor. Um, Monsignor has been coming here, you know, for the last two years. Um, he's been very gracious, contributing his time, and so we just kind of wanted to give you a little something. I know, he doesn't like what I do these things. <laughs> Ambush. Um, Ambush. Um, uh, University would like to express our appreciation to Monsignor Pablo Navarro for his continued generosity and service to our students and faculty. Anybody um, want to join any of the clubs, please reach out to me. Um, Ilkene Garcia is our Alvisu University Catholic Club president. And we are, and by the way, you did a beautiful job with the memorial service we had last um, for the Catholic uh, Orlando. By the way, it's online already. It's in the public, I'm going to email it to me, it's in the public drive, so all of you have access to the public drive. It's not edited. Uh, Jose, thank you so much. He videotaped the whole thing. He followed us out of the procession. You were a champ. Thank you, Jose. Uh, so we don't want to edit it because, you know, it's raw. So, you know, you can see everything on there. Um, it's about 30 minutes, 40 minutes long. Um, and it was really very moving and very touching. And you did a wonderful and beautiful job, I think. And uh, so we'll have our Catholic Club meeting soon, and we'll also have the Division 36 meeting within the next two weeks, I promise. Guys, you're looking at me like, let's have her. We will. Um, okay, so thank you very much, and have a wonderful week. Thank you. <laughs>